As a student of history, I love coming to out-of-the-way places. I'm here in Dallas, Georgia. I'm at a newly developing park. It's a, a park honoring the Orphan Brigade that in the, until the recent past, there was nothing here. It was just woods. It's as if the, the world had swallowed up the history of a group of people that lived and died right here for a short time. Now, the Orphan Brigade were Kentuckians. And I'm way down south here in Georgia. Kentucky was a northern state, and they're called the Orphans because they had joined the Southern cause. They had several famous leaders. One of them was a former vice president of the United States, John C. Breckinridge. Another was Abraham Lincoln's brother-in-law, Brigadier General Benjamin H. Helm. He's also the son of the Kentucky governor. I mean, this is a very important brigade, and right at this place, they ran into the Union lines unexpectedly, and about 600 of them died that day. One of the reports said they ran into a sheet of flame and death was feasting in our midst. But a lot of this history has been lost, even though this was 1864. That's not that long ago. It's not even two centuries ago. Most of the physical evidence has been destroyed by construction, by people moving in who have no idea what happened here in the past, by erosion, and by bad record keeping. It's as if you could put together a patchwork of events, but most of the details are already gone. And this was just 1864. I mean, that's less than 200 years ago. So we do have a nice record of what happened here, but it's incomplete. And the further back in time you go, the less complete the records become. Now let's jump back in time to about 1000 BC, the border of modern day Germany and Poland, way up north against the North Sea. A battle was fought there, a battle completely unknown to the history books. In fact, until an amateur historian had discovered a leg bone po poking out of a riverbank, they didn't even know this battle happened. And as they started excavating, they realized that all of their understanding of early European history was wrong because there weren't supposed to be large battles. There weren't supposed to be large groups of people. There wasn't supposed to be organized Bronze Age society so far north at that time. And yet, here are the bodies. In fact, in 450 square meters, they excavated no less than 130 different people. And two of them were women who were fighting in this battle. Who are these people? Where do they come from? We have no idea, but we've been able to use genetics to pull apart some of the puzzle. It turns out that the people on both sides of this battle were closely related. It wasn't like there was an invading army from far away. It was a massive battle between two competing groups that were culturally, or at least genetically, related to one another fighting over this marshy, swampy area that used to have a wooden bridge crossing it. And we have no idea why. Now, the reason I bring all this up, talking about history and a hint of genetics in there, is because we have to answer questions about history, genetics, and the Bible. And I want to illustrate that a lot of the information we simply cannot know. We can infer a little bit, but there's a lot we can't actually know for certain. For example, I had an article appear on creation.com just last week. It's called Genetic Diversity on the Ark. As a speaker, I travel around to a lot of different churches and schools and, and group settings, and I answer a lot of questions. And online, I answer a lot of questions on email every week, and a lot of questions I get asked many times. And so for this particular question, I said, that's it. I'm just going to type it down so now I have an article about it. And the question is, what about the genetic difference between the clean and unclean animals? Let me read to you Genesis chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens, also male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. Okay, so we have a difference between clean and unclean. Now granted, the law has not yet been given. The law is not going to be given for another thousand years in the time of Moses. But at this point in time, they already had um, some idea of substitutionary atonement. Just go back to the Cain and Abel story, where Cain brought vegetable material and Abel sacrificed a sheep. So, or at least sacrifice an animal. We know they had an idea of substitutionary blood atonement. They had some, at least, idea of clean versus unclean. And here we have Noah bringing 
pairs of animals. Now, some translations say seven, some say seven pairs. I'll let the theologians argue about that. All we know is that there's less unclean animals than there are clean animals per kind. So maybe there's, you know, two elephants versus 14 sheep, two mice versus 14 cows. So doesn't that automatically mean that there should be more genetic diversity amongst cows and sheep today than amongst mice and elephants? If you have more individuals, can't you have more genetic diversity? The answer is, we don't know. Because clean animals tend to be found in flocks. They tend to be inbred. We have no idea of the genetic history of the flocks that were used to populate the animals on board Noah's Ark. We simply cannot know that. So we cannot say, oh, there should be more diversity in clean animals. Who says? Plus, different groups of animals have different DNA repair enzymes. They have different strategies for reproduction. Some of them produce a lot and a lot die every year. Some of them produce a few and a lot survive out of those few. Some groups have had historically large population sizes. Some have had historically very small population sizes. Some populations have grown and then crashed and grown again. So putting all that together means you can't just do a across the board statement Clean animals should have more genetic diversity. You do not know that, which means we have a lot of options. The Bible has not pigeonholed itself saying this is something we would predict from the book of Genesis. It's not true. We don't know what's predicted because we don't have enough information to make a direct prediction. So however it works out, I'm perfectly comfortable with. We also have to define a particular word. The word is allele. This word is used ambiguously by scientists all the time. I can use it to mean several different things. And so what I mean by it depends on the context in which I'm saying it. An allele is just a variant. It just means that there's a genetic difference between this piece of DNA and that piece of DNA. So classic alleles would be the blue and the brown eyed alleles in humans or the ABO blood group. Now, AB and O, that's three different alleles. Does that mean that there's a problem here? Why do humans have three alleles if we just started from Adam? If we have Adam only, he has two copies of each chromosome, and the blood type gene, he's got two copies. He can only be A or B, A or O, O or O, B or B. He can't be A, B, and O at the same time. Ah, except clearly type O is a mutation. If you are type O, you have the A gene. A and B have multiple differences, two very different genes. But if you are O, you have the A gene and there's a mutation in it that prevents the production of a working enzyme. The enzyme that sticks the sugars on the outside of your cells is broken. So therefore, it looks like in the beginning, there were only two alleles for the blood type gene, A and B. But even if there are three or four or 40 today, that's not necessarily a problem because most alleles are very rare. If you look at blood genes, there's a lot of variation. You look at genes that affect height, weight, skin color, hair color, uh, metabolism, there's tons and tons and tons of variations within these genes. There are a lot more than two alleles for most genes because we've had thousands of years for mutations to accumulate and each person has a different history. The, each section of your DNA comes from a different family tree. And therefore, there are millions of possible family trees. There are millions of possible variants in any large section of DNA. Oh, but wait a minute, what's an allele? Is it a single letter difference? Or is it a big difference? Ah, that's part of the ambiguity. You see, the word was used before we discovered what DNA did. There's a gene that makes us fruitful. I have white eyes. Ooh, the white-eyed allele. Well, was that just one letter or a lot of letters? Was it a giant deletion? We had no idea until way later when we finally started sequencing fruit fly genomes to discover what that trait was caused by. So an allele can mean one letter. It can mean a section of DNA. It can mean a trait. So when someone says, hey, there are too many alleles for such and such, I say, whoa, whoa, whoa. what do you mean by the word allele? Oh, okay, so in this gene, which is maybe 10,000 letters long or so, there are a whole bunch of different variants. Fine, but look at any single letter in that gene. There's an A or a G, a C or a T, an A or a T, a C or a G. In other words, for almost all variants in the human genome, there are only two originals. We share amongst us about 10 million common variants that are found in twos. 
Those 10 million are found in every race on the earth. Oh, and you as an individual, I've said this before on biblical genetics, you as an individual have about 3 million places where the chromosomes you got from your mother differ from the chromosomes you got from your father. About 3 million places where they disagree at single letter positions. And if you have 3 million on your own, it would be trivial for God to engineer into Adam about 10 million, maybe more, because we have to allow the possibility that some genetic diversity has been lost, specifically at Noah's flood. So maybe Adam had 20 million, 15 million, it doesn't matter. It's easy to put that into Adam. And then since then, we've had a lot more mutations. So yeah, your genes have a lot more variation than two. And through recombination, genes have been recombining means if let's say there's a, a theoretical gene where every variant on this particular chromosome was A, 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 A. And on this corresponding one, it was G, 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 G in Adam. Well, recombination can happen and now we have four. We have A, A, G, 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 A, 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 G, G, A, 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 and G, 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 G. That's four different variants already and we only had one recombination event. Given thousands of years of recombination, this is exactly what we would expect to happen. We have a lot of allelic diversity and the whole challenge of, oh, there's only, there's too many alleles for these genes. is actually not true. It's actually a, a mirage. In that same article, I answered questions about uh, which of the different races came from Shem, Ham, or Japheth. And I very strongly pointed out that all of them, all races come from all three brothers and their three uh, wives. Why? Because in the generations leading up to the Tower of Babel event, races can't develop until after Babel. Because if you've got Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the Bible says there's one language. They're intentionally staying together. They're not spreading out. That's a recipe for social cohesion. In fact, God didn't like their cohesion. He said, these people are evil. I'm going to spread them out so we confuse their languages. But if you have social cohesion, you would have all three of the brothers' sons would be marrying all three of the other brothers' daughters and vice versa, vice versa, and vice versa. You can't get a Shem lineage, a Ham lineage, and a Japheth lineage. It's not possible. The three brothers' lineages are mixing together. At Babel, we spread out, but those five generations, plus or minus, between Noah and Babel, at least Noah and Peleg, which means we're all equally descended from the three brothers and their wives. There's no way around that. This also means that you cannot say, oh, well, maybe Ham's was black, or maybe Ham's wife was Asian looking. That's nonsense, because all of those genes are shared within, within this one nuclear family for multiple generations. They're completely scrambled up. And then when God divides the nations, yes, he divides them according to Y chromosome. He divides them according to male ancestry. But only the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome doesn't affect the way people look. It controls male versus female, but not black versus white or Asian or anything like that. It's not a factor here. So if you're still holding on to the idea that there are three main races in the world, the Caucasian, the Negroid, and the Mongoloid, get it out of your head. It's not true. It's not true genetically. It's not true scripturally. It's not even true according to the evolutionary theory. That version of history was invented by outright racist 19th century evolutionary scientists. It needs to be dispelled with. It's simply not true. And one way to know that is sure, if you go to Iceland, Japan, and Southern Africa, you can find people that look very different from one another. But what happens when you go in the middle? What happens when you go to Egypt? The genetics of Egypt are very much like the genetics of the Mediterranean basin, not like Southern Africa. What happens when you go to a place like Tajikistan, Iran? What you find is people that are a blend. Yeah, there are extremes, but in between there's a gradation. There's no line you can draw on a map to say, ah, here's the difference between the Japhethites and the Semites. It's not true. Plus, biblically, if you look at the table of nations, they all lived on top of each other. So I'm not sure why people want to hold on to this three races idea. I'm encouraging you to please get rid of it. Go read my article on creation.com. Now, even though I've come out to this lovely natural area, nature is going to get the best of me. And I, I'm sure you can hear the thunder and here comes the rain. So I got to pack up and get out of here. You all have an awesome day and I'm going to go have fun stomping through puddles. <laughs>